So my name's Kieran Jacobson. I'm going to try and talk to you about making uh, DNS sort of less suck, I suppose, is the best way of describing it. DNS is one of these underappreciated services. Um, well, we, we don't really appreciate it until it goes down. And then we realize how stuffed we are. Uh, we're in a world of pain. And last year was a year of significant DNS outages with almost every major service provider having some sort of outage. April was Microsoft and Azure related services last year. Uh, July, we saw Oracle, UPS, FedEx, Steam, LastPass and the PlayStation network down because there was an issue with Akamai DNS. September, Slack went down. Most developers realized that that was a lovely holiday. In October, the internet basically melted because Meta, and Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp uh, all became unavailable due to some routing changes that made Meta's DNS services uh, no longer respond. Uh, and then finally, in December last year, AWS went down. Um, there was issues with AWS's DNS services provider, or DNS services, I should say. Um, and that took down a whole bunch of other providers and a whole bunch of other services that all relied on that as well. But it's not just outages when it comes to DNS that makes it suck. DNS attacks are growing more frequent every year. Um, the most common that we're still seeing is compromised credentials, brute force credentials to try and get in and start making changes to DNS zones and DNS portals. Uh, but there's another one that's starting to become more frequent, especially as we're starting to move more to DevOps and really agile deployment strategies, and that's called dangling DNS entries. So what's a dangling DNS entry? Let's take a look at the scenario where we go ahead and provision an Azure service. We call it app-contograit-dev001.azurewebsites.net. We're also going to assign a C name to it, uh, greatapp.contoso.com. After some time, we decide we no longer need that service, so we just go into the Azure portal and we delete it. Uh, the problem we've now got is that we've got this dangling entry. We've still got that C name of Great App pointing through to that Azure website's address. And after a period of time, some sort of threat actor comes along and sees that that's available. And what they do is they provision another app service using that same great, great app dash, uh, app dash contour great dash dev dash zero zero one dot Azure websites dot net. They might put some malicious content on there. Um, and so what they've now got is they've got an opportunity to use your company's brand, the domain name, that is part of your corporate brand, to start launching attacks against maybe it's you, could be your customers, could be any, all sorts of things. Um, these sorts of attacks are really powerful when it comes to trying to do targeted phishing attacks. Um, your employees are used to seeing and going to sites and services that is name dot company name dot com. So if I was to send them an email that said go and click on this link and log into greatapp.contoso.com, they're more likely to fall victim to those sorts of attacks. The other challenge is that if I've got these sort of access, um, cookie harvesting attacks, cross-site scripting, um, cause attacks, there's a bunch of other browser attacks we can actually start to launch on the end user as well. Why is this a problem? Well, it comes down to, to, to brand damage and reputation damage, and that's stuff that's very difficult to repair long term. So how do we go about trying to make this process better? How do we make it suck less? Um, the Stack Exchange team over the years, they manage quite a large DNS infrastructure, um, and they developed DNS control, and that's based upon their experience with DNS and their experience going through multiple DNS provider outages. And along with the community, they built DNS control and it uses an infrastructure as a code approach. It uses JavaScript as a DSL that you can use to describe your domain name and the zone and all the, all the records within it. Not only can you use it to describe the zone, but you can then use it to push the settings out to production it supports 40 or 50 different DNS providers, and you can have it go and create entries, delete entries, or even modify entries in your zone. 
Um, the other thing is, using my little pointer here, you can see what's a DMARC entry. You can see that I've got some CAA records, and you can see the A records. So it's really clear what's what. I've got comments that say, this is the production website. You know, this is the records for Office 365. So then when it starts to come to that process of, well, what's this record for, or what's that record for, it starts to close the gap. It's easier for us when we're going back six years later and going through a DNS zone to know what we can and can't delete. So let's say I wanted to make a change, uh, and I've, these are some screenshots from an old conference presentation, but say I wanted to create a record called hello.planetpowershell.com and then have the contents as some sort of hello message. All I have to do is use my favorite editor, say VS Code, to go in and edit the dnscontrol.js file, put the extra records in, and then go ahead, commit those to a branch, push that up to GitHub, create a pull request. And in this case, I'm just doing it all in, in Git Kraken. Once I've got that pull request set up, I can then start to do a pull request review. Most devs in the room are pretty comfortable with this. What's really handy with DNS control is it also gives us uh, functionality and features to be able to verify the contents and test that that file is valid using the uh, check command, but we can also get a preview of what changes it would make if we told it to using the uh, test command, the preview command, sorry. And so I can build those into my, my um, GitHub uh, checks, my pull request checks, um, and then as part of that review, I can actually go in and take a look at the, the, the build, so to speak, and I can see the preview and go, okay, yep, if we commit this to, to the main branch and have it be deployed to prod, it's going to create this entry for us. And so if I was to merge that to main, um, I could then simply go ahead and start to uh, use the DNS control push command, and that will actually make those changes. And I can watch in real time as in my, cloud, in my DNS provider's console, the changes are made, and then of course, after an arbitrary period of time, I'll also be able to see that those records have become available using a tool like MX Toolbox. But there's also other ways that DNS control starts to make things more simple. DNS records, aren't the easiest things to understand and create. There's a lot of complicated syntax normally. So what DNS control has is it has these builders that help accelerate and make the process easier. The first is the SPF record builder. Normally this is a text file with a whole bunch of weird lines and it's kind of complicated to write. The builder allows us to make it nice, neat, separate files. The builder also has some features to help us when we start to hit some of the limits of SPF records. You might not know it, but you can only have a maximum of 10 DNS queries in your SPF record. So we often have to do this trick called flattening, where we go and do the queries and sort of build out 10 magic records that fits all the IP addresses so our email works. This is all built in a DNS control. It does it all for you. So it's really lightening the load on, on your administrators, your ops teams to do this work. Another entry that's kind of hard to build is your DMARC entries. Um, it's, you know, plus R dash, you know, this dash, this dash, dash, this. It's, it is a tricky thing. Um, with a DMARC builder, we actually can talk in terms of policies instead of P equals. Um, you know, we can start to make these entries a little bit more easy to understand. And just some quick links before I finish up, because I'm almost out of time. I did an hour-long version of this session at Linux Conf AU at the start of the year. Um, that video is up online. I've got some links here also on actually starting your journey to migrate to DNS control and also set up the CI CD processes. Um, I've also got a repo that's like a, you know, a starting place, sort of a, a template for DNS control as well. Um, and also check out DNS control's own migration guide. Thank you.